All right, Alexander, let's do an update on what is going on in Ukraine. We have, uh, according to the New York Times, we have a different strategy now that uh, Ukraine is undertaking, and that is one of drones. The new plan now, after the big counteroffensive, the big counteroffensive reboot, is that uh, we're on plan C or D now, which is they're going to manufacture drones and they're going to attack uh, Russian territory. And um, we even have statements coming from Ukraine officials claiming that they're going to take the fight to Russian land. Uh, what, what do you make of, of these reports, Alexander, and uh, an update as to what is happening on the ground in Ukraine? Uh, still a stalled offensive. It's not going anywhere. It's not moving, it seems. Uh, fierce fighting in some cities, but we're now two months plus into this big counteroffensive, and uh, Ukraine has made, the Ukraine military has made zero progress. Shoiku actually gave an assessment for the month of July, and he said over 20,000 uh, Ukraine uh, soldiers have been lost. I don't know if that means uh, KIA or um, KIA and, uh, and injured, but 20,000 plus just in July is a catastrophic number for the Ukraine military. He also said 2,000 plus uh, military vehicles have also been destroyed in Absolutely. July. Absolutely. Anyway, uh, what, what, what do you make of, of everything that's happening in Ukraine? Well, br briefly, I think you've summed it up very well. First of all, I mean, the great offensive, we've now gone through three plans. Plan A was this big arm and push, the fist that was going to break through um, or right through the Russian defences. They would battle through to the Sea of Azov, they would get there within about two to three weeks. That was plan A, and that collapsed disastrously in the first two weeks of June with enormous losses, losses which have now been admitted by um, the Western media, and um, massive losses in numbers. And then plan B was to supposedly conduct attrition, to launch... Uh, light infantry attacks backed by artillery, forced the Russians supposedly to deplete their ammunition stocks, wear down the Russian defences, knock out Russian artillery positions. Ukraine is claiming that they're knocking out more Russian artillery positions than I'm sure they actually are. But anyway, that was, that was plan B. And that was going to destabilise the Russian defences. And that didn't work. Again, huge losses. That was, we heard what Shoigu had to say about the huge numbers of losses Ukraine has suffered in July. And then there was Plan C, which we discussed a couple of uh, uh, days ago, which is the reboot of the offensive. Go back to the original plan, send a new armoured fist, more armoured fists, trundling through the Russian defences. Um, and this is going to be the restart of the offensive. And if you remember, the New York Times, where we were reading about this, said that it would take one to three weeks for the breakthrough to take place. Well, we're, we're now one week from that article and there's been no breakthrough. More heavy losses, more machines destroyed. In fact, I've actually seen one report that suggests that on one particular day, I think it was the 26th of July, Ukraine suffered the heaviest losses, both in equipment and men, that it has lost over the entire course of the offensive. So that turned out to be completely, completely wrong. And they're pushing forward. They've been trying to push forward. They've been trying to capture various villages, Piatikhatki, Rabotino, Staromayorsk, Kleshevka near Bakhmut. And they're bogged down fighting over these villages. They still haven't managed to consolidate control over any of them. They haven't even got close to Rabotino, despite the fact that at one point last week, they were actually claiming to have captured it. It wasn't true, but there were those reports. And as has been correctly pointed out on a thread somewhere, so long as Ukraine is bogged down fighting over little villages, some distance from the major Russian fortified lines, its offensive is visibly failing. Now, I think this is starting to be understood 
by everybody that this offensive is not going to succeed. It's not going to break through the Russian lines. The Russian lines are too strong. The Russian positions are too entrenched. The Russian troops are too disciplined. So now we have plan D, which is to actually launch fleets of drones, supposedly against Russia. We're learn in re reading that the Ukrainians are frantically putting together as many drones as they can. These are small drones up to now. The idea seems to be um, to try to launch attacks on Moscow specifically, and that allegedly is going to shake the Kremlin and shatter the confidence of the Russian people, and it will change the direction of the war. Um, that is an even more fantastical idea about how to win this war for Ukraine than any of the others. These drone attacks are pinpricks. They're not achieving anything important. They're crashing, or rather they're, they're being brought down by Russian air defences. They've caused some minor damage to the business centre in Moscow. Anybody who has any knowledge of Russia will know that attacks of this kind in Moscow are not going to shake that city of, what is it, 12 million people. I mean, what goes on in the business center isn't really of great importance to the vast majority of people in Moscow. And, of course, anybody who simply looks at a map and takes into account the sheer vastness of Russia knows that a drone offensive against this enormous country is just a nonsensical idea and you can't if whatever psychological effect you achieve in moscow it's not going to have any effect in perm in novosibirsk in krasnoyarsk in all sorts of other places to the east all that is going to do there is to make people angry yeah uh, it's it reeks of this whole plan reeks of desperation um, Absolutely. What, what's the role? What's the role in this that uh, the U.S. has and NATO has? Because obviously, this yeah. isn't. I don't think this is Zelensky's plan. I mean, it's it, yeah. maybe it's crazy enough for, for for Zelensky to come up with. Maybe it's cinematic enough for yeah. him to come up with this drone wars, right? But uh, what? How, how much involved do you think is is the collective West in in this? And uh, do you think that maybe this could be some sort of a, of a fake out, maybe a distraction? Maybe they're they're saying this to, to distract Russia away from something else that they're planning. Well, that is the last is certainly possible. And you know, with with Ukraine and with the people in charge in Washington, who are also beginning to become desperate. By the way, I mean, uh, to re repeat again, the Biden White House does not want to see a debacle in Ukraine. I mean, they're getting very, very nervous about this. They'd staked a huge amount of political capital on this effect, on this counteroffensive. They're now starting to realize that it's most unlikely to succeed. And it could be that they're sending these fleets of drones or that they're encouraging the Ukrainians to send these fleets of drones because something altogether more dramatic of a sort that I can't imagine. But, you know, I'm not in a position to imagine that kind of thing is being prepared. And I'm afraid that is a real that is a real risk and we shouldn't overlook it. And it might not be a military thing. It might be, for example, that the US might start thinking about reckless things like a sea blockade of Russia. There's already talk that the um, West, that the United that the West, the United States, the European Union are going to try to close off the Baltic, for example, to Russian shipping. So to prevent Russian oil tankers, for example, leaving St. Petersburg with oil and they'll be seized on the high seas and that kind of thing. So, you know, I don't want to speculate too far, but the possibility that it is a distraction from that is real. But overall, putting all that aside, putting these dramatic and potentially disastrous scenarios to one side, which would, by the way, amount to, in effect, a clash between the American military and Russia. It's important to remember that. Um, putting aside those scenarios, for me, the US response to these drone attacks 
is another falling away of the mask. Because when things like that have happened in the past, we've had these mumbled comments appearing from anonymous US officials in the New York Times especially, telling us that the United States doesn't really approve of this sort of thing. In fact, it disapproves of this sort of thing. It doesn't want Ukraine to carry out these kind of attacks. <laughs> now, it's quite clear that the United States actually supports these attacks and probably has been doing so all along. So it's these attacks are not going to succeed. They're not going to shake the Kremlin. They're not going to shatter the confidence of the Russian people in the policy of the Kremlin. On the contrary, they're going to simply confirm the general view in Russia that Ukraine is a threat to Russia and must be dealt with in that in accordance with that. But we see that these reckless, irresponsible strategies of launching these kind of pinprick attacks in Russia, they are not just something the Ukrainians by themselves have come up with. The Americans, or at least some people in the United States, are involved in them too. Yeah, they're getting very, very desperate. Uh, yes. The Zelensky regime is getting desperate. The European Union is getting desperate. The Biden White House is getting desperate. And things are going very bad for the Biden White House. Uh, most of it is connected to Ukraine, whether it's, it's the conflict, whether it's uh, testimony that is taking place in Congress in and around Burisma. Uh, Ukraine is, is, is proving to be the end of, uh, of Biden's uh, presidency. Yes, that's my thought on, uh, on it. But, um, and, and it's been a long process. This has been a, a, an eight, nine year process, to, to be quite honest, uh, Biden and, and Ukraine. But uh, go back to the possible uh, blockade of the Baltic Sea, and maybe you may want to connect that to the EU's desperation in their 12th sanctions package announcement, where it is being uh, stated by various MEPs in, uh, in Germany, specifically that uh, they have given the approval, the go-ahead, to seize the Russian frozen uh, assets, which is something that Germany specifically has been against, understanding that this will sink the, the financial credibility of Germany and the European Union. But it looks like they're now so desperate yes. to, to do something and to, I guess, to, to, to jump off this, uh, this sinking ship, at least with a big bag of money in hand. <laughs> That's the way I'm kind of visualizing this. That they're now saying, you know, let's let's get these frozen assets. At least let's let's leave this with something tangible. Yes. So th there there does seem to be a lot of desperation in the European Union. But the Baltic Sea thing is very troubling, and the seizing of Russian assets is troubling, while also very revealing. To me, it's troubling because of what they're going to be doing on a on a legal uh, from a legal standpoint. Yeah. But it's very revealing because it shows to me that the EU elite. These robber barons in, in Brussels, uh, they seem to be saying, you know, uh, we might as well, we got not, we might as well, we got to get the money out now. Let's get it out yes. now before all of yes. this is, comes to a crash again. Well, you're absolutely correct. I mean, I mean, the Baltic Sea thing is incredibly worrying, and I mean, there's articles now appearing in the Swedish media about this, and we'll we'll, we'll see whether it happens. It's an incredibly dangerous and reckless thing to do. And um, we'll see what the U.S. military thinks about this, because, of course, Russia has a powerful fleet. It's got large amounts of supersonic and hypersonic anti-ship missiles. You know, if it takes steps to defect, to protect its shipping, then, as I said, we could be in an uncontrollable situation. And, of course, the U.S. Navy has been made very clear that they're not going to take any step to protect Ukrainian grain ships. The Turkish Navy has said the same. So I would have thought that the military of the United States would not be happy about that. But the very fact that these crazy theories about, you know, sea blockades are being discussed at all tells us how desperate people are. And you're quite right about the frozen assets, the seizing of the frozen assets. Now, we've had one article one commentary after another saying repeatedly that they've exhausted every conceivable legal route to find a way to do this thing that will give them some degree of legal cover 
if they do it. And they have been repeatedly told by legal lawyers, every lawyer that they have consulted, that it can't be done, that it can't be done legally. And there's been objections to doing it on that basis. And now, nonetheless, they are prepared to take this giant step into outright illegality and they're preparing to seize these assets. Now, just take a step back and think what that means. Is it going to affect Russia? Is it going to affect the Russian economy? The answer is no. The, the Russians cannot use these frozen assets. So it's not going to make any difference to um, the performance of the Russian economy, which is now growing fast, well above, apparently, according to the Russian government, well above the rate of 2.5% two, two a year, which means that Europe, as it goes into recession, the Russian economy is growing faster. It's the opposite of what the sanctions were. So it's not going to affect Russia because the Russians don't have access to this money anyway. It's going to push the European Union into an act of outright illegality. It's going to create shockwaves around the world in places like the, the Middle East, uh, the Gulf, uh, um, in the Far East. People will be saying, well, we really cannot risk having our assets, our money in Europe any longer because look what they do. They actually not only seize them, they not only freeze them, they're prepared to steal them as well. So already there's been a pullback of gold and foreign currency out of the EU because of the original freezing of the Russian central bank reserves. Now that's going to gain pace and all for nothing, for no actual gain, for no actual political gain. It's just what you said, just some people want to get their hands on the money. It's it, it, it serves no geopolitical purpose. It is politically utterly misconceived and counterproductive. And it is incredibly sordid as well. It's just people going out and stealing money. That's all it is at the end of the day. OK, let's wrap the video up. But stealing money because they understand things are not working out. Well, exactly. I mean, one, it looks desperate. And the other is it, look, it looks sorted. I mean, it, it looks both at the same time. I mean, it's a terrible look. By the way, you know, blockading Russian oil exports from the Black, uh, Baltic Sea isn't going to make any difference either because the Russians will simply redirect their exports. <laughs> They'll send them through Murmansk, through the Arctic uh, roads, or from Vladivostok or wherever. These are crazy ideas. And do they really want to interfere with the oil trade anyway? given that oil prices are rising once more. But it's desperate. But desperation is causing people to become increasingly reckless. They've shown already an astonishing disregard for legal safeguards anyway. But now you see that they're prepared to go even further. They're prepared to sink even lower. They're, going to, they're prepared to behave like simply an ordinary set of thieves. That's how it's going to be seen around the world. Well, that, you know, that's how the EU has, has always acted. That's always their of default course it position. Is. We go back of to course it the is. crisis yeah. in uh, yeah. 2009, 2010, the crisis in uh, 2013 in Cyprus. Their default position always ends up being, let's take the money. You know, it's so no matter, even if it does harm to their own uh, EU values and institutions. They always go for you, the money. You know, what you say is so interesting because, of course, I, I've never been a criminal lawyer. I've never undertaken criminal work at all, but I know quite a few. And what they always tell me is, you know, the thing about big criminal gangs, organised crime, if you like, is that they always operate behind a veil of legality. They have lots and lots of lawyers. They're always able to come up with all kinds of legal arguments. They do all kinds of, they, you know, listening to them, they are the most law-abiding people on the planet. And at the same time, of course, they're criminals. And they go out and they steal money and uh, uh, they engage in illegal activities. Well, the European Union 
dare I say it, the great European Union, the exemplar, uh, uh, the protector of values, all of those things, is starting to behave or look like it's the same. It's the same as those organized criminal rackets. They talk law. They always protest about how they value law. They talk about the right to property, the protections of the, you know, the free market protections, all of those kinds of things. But of course, the reality is beginning to look like it's completely different. That this, like with the mafiosos who have, you know, as I said, the veil of lawyers and the veil of legality that they lurk behind, the European Union is just the same. All right, you know, yeah, let's let's end it there. If, if any, if anybody had any sense, whether it's in the U.S. or the EU, they would just admit that they've lost this conflict. Plain and simple. Well, exactly. Yes. Plain and simple. Of course. Yes. And move that's on. the one thing they can lost this conflict and move on. on. And move on exactly. And you know, and you were saying that's, uh, that's the I one thing they cannot. They cannot bring themselves to do. Despite the fact that what you said, I, I remember you saying this a year ago, earlier than that, that they have such powerful control of the media that they could probably, even if they did that, they could probably spin their way out of it. But they're so viscerally committed to this one <laughs> that, that, that they can't even bring themselves to do that. Yeah, the, the, the U.S., the Biden White House could definitely spin their way out of this one. God knows he has all kinds of other headaches that he needs to deal with. He could easily uh, get his media cronies to, to spin this one as some sort of pullback and we achieved yeah. what we wanted to achieve and, you know, whatever. I mean, they could come up with all kinds of narratives and scenarios yes. and, and yeah. a lot of people will, will believe it. But anyway, all right, uh, we'll leave it there. The Duran.locals.com. We are on Rumble, Odyssey, BitChute, Telegram and rock fin and go to the Durant shop 10% off use the code good day take care